Hello. Um, I am Matt Ricardo, which if you're watching this on my channel, you've probably gathered that already. Um, I'm doing this video as a sort of behind the scenes or a how we got to where we did um, as a follow up to Perifractix uh, video, um, which uh, is out now, uh, at least. Uh, it's coming out on Saturday, I believe, this Saturday the 13th. So um, it should be up by now. Uh, and this was, it, he did a video that was a follow up to a, uh, a, a video from about a week ago where he got hold of the original Team 17 hard drives um, from Chris Blythe and they got them booted up and got access to them and found all of the original Worms cutscenes. I got super excited about this because I grew up, uh, well, I grew up from ZX81 upwards and through the Amigas. And of course, Worms was the killer app for, for the Amiga. It was the game that everybody had along with, you know, the likes of Lemmings. And so I said, please, please, please release the files and let us re-render them in modern versions of Lightwave as they were they were used in the uh, Amiga version of Lightwave, which I think was like version 3.5 or 4. So uh, anyway, there was some communications. Uh, we struck out a sort of plan of attack and I got sent three uh, Win UAE images uh, for the drives, which I uh, duly set up and got fired up on my uh, Win UAE rig here, got the files off and just started picking through them and and they were as i remember them the, the amiga light wave uh, there wasn't much in the way of structure things kind of went anywhere and were called anything and so the first task was actually to understand how team 17 and chris and and those guys that had developed these animations had actually figured out you know how, what was their thought process in storing the files um, so before I could actually ever load anything, I had to figure out where they left stuff and what they called stuff. So if I just give you a, uh, a look at the directory structure. So uh, I've, this isn't the entire hard drive, this is just the uh, Lightwave scenes uh, and objects and things extracted. So if we go to scenes, for example, now on a PC, of course, uh, we all know that a file system, that you know, the file system accepts, um, extensions. So down here you can see that a Lightwave scene file is called a .lws. Um, this version also supports FBX and um, Collada DAE. Now um, in the days of the Amiga we didn't have extensions on file names. There, some programs did like Amos, so you could save something at Amos and that was a, a, an Amos back basic file. Um, mods were always mod.something so they had a prefix not a suffix. Um, and with Lightwave, it kind of, anything goes really. So if we just dig down and I absolutely got excited, let's say, when I saw these directories, um, because I was only interested in worms, but I realized that Super Stardust, Project X, Alien Breed, I absolutely uh, got silly, basically. But the bad news is that the stuff isn't there. There are some scenes, but most of the objects appear to be missing. So they've either been moved to another machine before the images were, were made. But uh, yeah, that was um, super excitement and then absolutely massive disappointment as they're not there. So we have a look in the Worms directory. Now there are, are some things that were not rendered as part of my video sequence uh, for Perifractic. Um, there was the setups directory and there was the shotgun directory. Um, now there were actually more cutscenes in, uh, in Worms, obviously. There's the intro sequence with the guns and the, the bullet belts waving about and things like that. And uh, I'm sure they're in here somewhere, but I just literally went for the stuff that I could load and that I could process. So if we have a look in the Uzi um, directory. So the Uzi animation is actually made up from six shots. And sometimes a shot is longer than you see in one bit and they basically snip it up and use later bits of it uh, after other shots. So it's it's a bit like if you filmed uh, a, a camcorder interview with somebody for 10 minutes and then you snipped it up to, in, in, to inject in between those shots um, 
other bits of footage. So you, you break up a long shot into smaller shots. But this wasn't what I found. These are my files. So if we have a look at all files, these are the original files from the Amiga. Now, and I will say this video is probably going to be quite long and quite boring and lots of reasonably static screens with me talking in the background. But, um, you know, if you don't want to watch it, skip ahead. That's absolutely fine. Um, so the thing that we noticed, first of all, uh, in these scenes was there seemed to be a sort of shot number structure. So there was Uzi scene one. And then there was a version 0.5 of it and a version 0.6. So my approach was always to load up the last version of each of the scene numbers. And you can see it goes, there's an 8.3 there and there's an 8.3 no trees. And there's some of the things that they've done to sort of speed up the render time has, uh, like one of the cheats uh, in one of the animations, the missile animation, uh, there's a shot. In fact, I've got it. Um, where are we? Missile. So this is the this is the modern version of the missile. Now the shot where he runs away. In fact, I think this shot as well, actually. So this is all real. We're flying through 3D. This one, yeah. So this shot, um, the worm is basically running on a on a. A background plate. This is like a rear projection. So there's a big rectangle with a picture painted on it and in the original the worm just runs into the distance to like towards the rectangle and there's no shadow and now in, in this modernized version that I've done I've actually put a ground plane in and uh, matched it so that it's it's got that image projected on it so that it casts a shadow in roughly the right direction and with the right contrast to the tree shadows. Um, so this, this was a pre-rendered shot you can see there's a tree in the ground over there. Or it, it, perhaps it's actually there's a, a hill and it's just over the, the brow of the hill maybe. But otherwise, yeah, that's through the ground. Um, but there was lots of this. When we uh, loaded up the scenes and I started picking through them, I was emailing uh, Perifractic over and over saying, you know, this is, have a look at this and this is exciting and, and this looks weird. Um, and yeah, this, this shot is basically just a, a back projection with a worm running at it. So the thing was, of course, in the olden days, in the Amiga days, these frames would take a minute to two minutes per frame. And nowadays on modern hardware, the, the same frame at the same resolution, which these, these worms animations were rendered at uh, 640 by 480, and then scaled down, I believe, to sort of PAL and uh, CD video resolutions. Um, hang on a second. Quick sip. Um, so... Re-rendering at those resolutions, yes, they're basically instant. It's like less than a second a frame. But when you start to replace those models, like the tree model is dreadful. When you actually see the geometry in the tree, it's it's horrendous. Good for the time, but horrendous nowadays. Um, so I've replaced it with another pine tree, and it's got, you know, 12,000 pine needle leaves on it, and they're all transparent. And so that immediately throws the render time back up. Uh, and of course, rendering at HD, we're talking, you know, quadruple plus the resolution, along with uh, motion blur and um, uh, depth of field in some scenes and uh, things like that. Certainly a lot of anti-aliasing, which we didn't have in the, the older scenes because the resolution really didn't warrant it. But if we have a look at uh, this scene, for example, so I'm going to load this up and it tells me it's a really old scene. Do you want to make a copy? And I won't for speed reasons. Um, so this is what I actually started to see every time I loaded up one of the original scenes. Now, it is there. If we switch to uh, VPR, this is the uh, rendering viewport. This is the scene. Now, you can straight away see the problem with the tree that I was talking about. So in order to save a lot of time, again, there was a lot of backplate projection and things like that. But the tree is essentially a lot of what we call two-point polys or basically lines. Uh, stuck over a wobbly cylinder trunk and now the trunk only goes halfway up and because these only used these used to render out a, a pixel thickness which on 64480 or below was plenty but of course you render them up in a modern resolution and you can see right through them and one pixel is nothing nowadays uh, you can also see the uh, nasty edge there on the uh, very low resolution mountain so 
this is essentially as was bar, uh, you know, compressing the life out of the image and, and loads of colour bleed and things like that. Uh, it is rendering it in a higher colour count, obviously. This isn't rendering it in hand mode because we don't have that on PCs anymore. Well, we don't have that on PCs at all. Um, and obviously you can straight away see all of the original geometry issues like the uh, the armpits, the, the famous armpits. The the eyes are actually cut into the, the worm's head. So this is all a single object, if I, if I recall. Um, certainly there's some objects that are just a worm body and then there's another one which is a body with eyes and uh, there's a, a blink version of that same body. So the idea was they would actually switch them out when they wanted to blink, uh, which worked in those days, but there's a much cleaner way of doing it nowadays. And you can see as well, his hand is coming through the, uh, the gun there. Um, there aren't any shadows to speak of, not, certainly not that I can see in this scene. Uh, there's lighting, so the, 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 the light is um, uh, darker here. There's less of it getting here because the light source is sort of over in this direction but there's no actual shadows. His eyebrow isn't casting a shadow onto his face or the tree isn't casting a shadow on the floor and so on. Um, and we can have a look at, uh, these are just the basic properties as imported. So this is a 64480 scene. Um, it has some motion blur, although there's none in the, on this frame because it's frame zero. If we go to maybe frame 150, it'll render up and we can see the motion blur there. Um, so again, the tree's not moving, so it really stands out. There's a light. The reason the lights come up this is because there's a light every time the bullet fires, and the, uh, the it lights the scene. But it actually lights the whole scene. There's no fall off on the light that I can find. So it lights the tree over there, which it, it shouldn't really, and and the mountain. So if we just have a look. At, uh, the textured wireframe again. And what I'll do is I'll call up the scene editor. So these are all of the objects and all of their keyframes um, throughout uh, the time. So the animation is 350 frames and we're working at 200, uh, 25 frames a second in these sequences as well. So uh, you can see all the various objects and how they're parented up the landscape homing missile that gets used in almost all of the animations uh, and landscape mounting gets used in every single animation. Um, then there's the pine trees and what they did was they, they got a group of pine trees and attached them to one tree so they could move them around as a block. Um, you've then got the worm, uh, which is, this is the worm without the eyes and then he's built up of a bone structure and this helps them animate the actual character. So rather than actually build a worm for every, shape of worm they might need, they build a worm with his arms out, uh, what we call T-pose, and then you just animate the bones uh, as required. Um, there's the eyes parented to it and the eyebrows, and then there's the Uzi and the gun blast and the light associated with that gun blast. So all of these uh, are currently shown as boxes, so let's actually just select everything and say show as textured, textured shaded solid wireframe. And I'm also going to set the colors of all the items to white and to white. And we can leave those on yellow. So if we bin that off now, so this is a textured wireframe. And if we just switch to a textured shot, so you can see here, there's this thing, what we call, this is what we call the limited range. And so even though we've got this much uh, frame, 64480, we're actually only rendering out a widescreen look. So in the game, we would have seen bars top and bottom on a, on a four by three screen. If we turn that off, that's more, that section there is more what we'd be used to to a four by three screen. So we can actually just scroll through this and you can see the worm is sort of cut in half and it's because we're so close to it that we need to actually change some of our scaling. If we change it back too far, we sort of bring the, the, fur, the well, I suppose in gaming terms, it's the draw distance, but we, we reduce the draw distance to nothing. And if we push it away, and that's just changing the scale of what we're working in. So at the moment we're working at two meters. So we can scrub through this fairly quickly. You know, I mean, it plays, it should play in real time.
brilliant. The, the amount of emotion they got in these characters for for how little there are of them is insane. It's absolutely insane. So this is what the scene looks like. Essentially what I did was I loaded each scene in, let it find all the objects on the drive because they, they all needed um, locating because the, the drive structure was all different now. And uh, then I started saving out scenes as was and then rendering them up. And those are what we called the modern scenes. So we got the original analog uh, that was salvaged off a YouTube video. Um, then we got the modern re-renders, which was just as untouched as we can get. Same resolution, same settings, rendered out uh, to compare against. Now, in order to get these into the what we called the modern versions, which was where we turned it into HD and we... Um, replaced objects with better objects and fixed the worm models and things like that that was the, the I mean that was a huge undertaking I mean essentially I got the drive images I think on Saturday and by Sunday I'd already I was by Saturday night I'd already loaded in a worm model and sent a picture of that over to uh, Perifractic and I had by Sunday or sun, Sunday morning or Sunday lunchtime I think managed to get the scenes in and rendering and then it was just a case of queuing them up and hitting the go and uh, that took no time that was like a day and we were done um, but yeah these ch replacing these scenes with uh, modern versions that was an undertaking because part and parcel of it was really creating a new structure so if we have a look in the objects directory so when you when you got Lightwave on your Amiga, it had a set of content that came with it, and it's the it's the classic content everybody remembers it. Uh, everybody knows generic panels, the IFF and things like that. Um, but you had all these folders like animals and uh, computer, and they're all just objects of a particular type. So in furniture, there is a coffee table, and that is a low polygon coffee table. And the way Team 17 had organised their objects is rather than put them into a folder called Worms Objects and everything to do with that animation went in there, they just used the structure that was already in the content directory. So when you're actually looking through the scene files as text, because you can uh, a scene file is basically a, a plain text file you can read and edit, um, you realise that the objects are kept in animals. And so these are objects that I've loaded and resaved myself, so it adds the extension, but these are all the original. So you can see this, there's, there's no sort of naming convention of sorts with any of these. You've got arm binox, arm binox reflection. So that is the arms that are used in the minefield scene where you can see the minefield reflected in the binoculars. And then this was just a straight pair of binoculars with just black fronts to them. Uh, in my version, I actually replaced both of those with a higher res version of binoculars and arms and actually put a real time reflection on them so it was really reflecting what was in front of the character. Um, but the main one was worms and uh, this was highlighted in Perifractic's original video and everyone wanted to know it. It is in fact a damaged model as far as I can tell. It will not load uh, in so we will never know what that is. Um, we could keep the partially loaded object. Oh, there we go. That's, that's what it's loaded in. I think this is one of the dead worms from the Uzi scene. Um, that's actually loaded. That's quite good, actually, because I've tried a couple of different times to uh, load that with different versions, and it's, uh, it's always let me down. So yeah, that's, that's that. Now, when these come in, a lot of them are completely untextured and, and whatnot. Now, that worm that was in the Uzi animation was Worm Meta 2. So if we load him up, this is, this is the actual worm in a sort of T-pose um, that was used in the Uzi animation. It's the exact same file. Now, the, as I say, the problem you can see is with things like the armpits. And it's because these, these were created using a, a very old system called Metaballs. And uh, the way Metaballs work is you placed balls of varying sizes in 3D space. And then you said to it, 
create a skin and it would it would create this skin over the object and what I suspect happened is that they've they've created the arms as a skin as a like a metaballs and they've created the body as a metaballs and then they tried to join them up afterwards and this is why we've got this weird sort of tearing and if I put the um, the wireframe on there you see that that's even got a hole in it I don't even know if it's no there's not even a polygon there so that's an actual hole in the object um, now nowadays we use a different system for smoothing out uh, organic shapes like this called um, subdivision surfaces and it changes the way you you make an object because you can clearly see that this is made up from a ball structure it's it's um, made up of squares and then everything's been turned into triangles afterwards so that no matter which way it twists or turns it's always still a flat uh, flat surface because if you didn't know three point polygons are always flat um, four point polygons however can break basically break they they can be curved so if you think of a, an A4 sheet of paper and you pick up any one of the four corners uh, A4 is UK paper size so any sheet of paper if you pick up um, one of the corners and don't pick up the other three the paper curves but if you create a triangle and you move any one of those three corners around in 3D space, all the lines between any two points are always still straight. There's uh, there's no curve on that. And uh, so, yeah, triangles are like the universal 3D uh, modeling approach. Um, have been since the very early days of 3D. So this is what we started with. And obviously we've got to um, recreate this model. So what I'll do is I'll show you the recreated version. And what I did, once I'd got the original structure essentially ripped out of the original content directory, so I picked out everything that was the worm stuff from the entire collection, uh, I went through and renamed everything with an extension so that I can see it in all the software. And I uh, tried to rename any files that to make them make more sense and uh, then started to rebuild them. So if we have a look at uh, Worm Meta 2 as the remake, there he is. So you can see that this looks completely different. It's got curves and dots, whereas that one is a lot more lines and a lot more straight edges. So if we have a look here, for example, you can see that this is actually two straight lines. That's not a curve. It looks curved when you see it from a distance or when it's moving, but it's actually just a, lo a low polygon object. It's, I mean, this entire worm is 3,292 polygons, which in today's standards is nothing. Now, if we have a look at the remake object, so this is a curve, it's completely curved and it's infinitely curved in fact, it's, it has no polygon resolution as such, but it's actually just made up from that object. So this was the low polygon version that we started with and when we, when we hit the tab key in Lightwave, it smooths these, these sharp edges out into curves and it turns it into what we call a subdivision object. Now we can we can freeze this out. That's what it looks like if you freeze it, and you get this incredibly high detail object. And you can you can set the amount of detail that it creates. But we can actually leave it as this subdiv object and animate it later, and even control how detailed it is later on when we render it. So this was a, an easy choice for me. I went in and just used. In fact, we should be able to take that and put it in the background of that. So this was basically my guide. I, I used the original object and I went in and found where I could make the shape uh, match. And uh, it's like with this, there's a little bit, it's a little bit out, oh, it's a little bit out there. So I could pull that. 
and you can see where the original is poking through. And really just sort of get a get a feel for how it's gonna how it's gonna look compared to the original. And then when I got that, that was saved off. Uh, a lot of the surfaces, um, Perifractic mentions this in his original video. Um, is it that one, I think? So, uh, yeah, this has already been saved and fixed, but they were coming in far too shiny. So we were getting this sort of look to them. And that isn't how they looked in the original animation. It's just that over the years, the, the way that objects are stored and the surfaces on these objects are stored has changed. And so some of the information is lost in translation and it just did the best it could. So we went from that to that, which in the software, when you actually render up with lights on it uh, and, a, and a sky plane and things like that, looks a lot more like the original animation. And then there were things like the uh, weapons uh, were very low uh, polygon objects. If we go to objects, and again, they just dumped all the weapons they used in the weapons folder. Which sounds, it sounds intuitive now, if when I just say it, but actually, if you were going to say, can you just send me everything to do with the worms animations, please? That would have been an absolute nightmare to pick apart in back in the day. So we have got Uzi Body 7. Um, we're not going to have that image on tap. So this was the original Uzi model. And there's not a lot of detail to it. And all it had was a reflection map that we just didn't load because it, it won't matter for this. Um, and that was it. It was done. So we change that to da, 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 objects Uzi Body 7. to this. So this was an object uh, on a free 3D model site and I just got it and sized it and lined it up to the original as best I could. Again if we take a look at that. So the magazine isn't as tall on this one. Um, it's slightly off center and this was done because in a lot of the uh, scenes with the Uzi the hand was poking through the gun. So I could go in and I could fix every hand or I could fix one gun and it, it, it fixes the problem for itself. So uh, yeah, I just moved the gun slightly off center in that axis and it made for uh, a better looking sequence. So we went through and basically picked apart the scenes and picked apart the objects. Um, the pine tree that I mentioned earlier, that is you may not actually get the texture on this. Oh, it's done It's done a reasonable job of it. So this, the old tree, I don't know if I've got the old tree to hand. Well, it'll be on the original um, sequence. And I think it's in landscape. Pine, and we had pine dot tree and pine underscore tree. And there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to them. So this is pine underscore create tree, which is basically the same as pine dot tree. So that's the tree. And you can see here, if we just zoom in, it's literally just some lines. There's, there's no detail there at all. And the tree texture is, I think, a procedural. And it just, it just billowed out to this... Uh, this flat disc on the floor. And uh, the idea was that if you stuck that through the ground, some of it would, would stick through and some of it would be underneath. So it makes sense to do that, but it's just, it's just huge and it's, it doesn't, doesn't work in uh, today's uh, rendering standards. So we changed it over to, uh, so let's have a look at the actual poly count. So that's that tree, that whole tree is 3,586. So we switched it out for this, which is, 345,000 polygons 
And if we get in a little bit closer to this, like just one polygon leaf. So this one leaf has a sort of cross section of pine needles drawn on it and on there on both sides. And then this green section is transparent uh, later on. It's made transparent later on. So uh, yeah, that is significantly more polygons. And again, the trunk, uh, I added these little stickly branch things to it so that when I stuck this into the ground, there was a, just a little bit of an edge to the, to the grass. And you can see just from this view that the amount of work uh, that somebody's gone to to make this tree is ridiculous. And so there we go. So that's the sort of renovation on the objects that we did. And then uh, as far as the scenes themselves go, so as you saw, this was the... Uh, in fact, if we do camera properties, we can select HD. So this is, this is in essence the HD frame. And we could have just rendered that up and it would have looked clean, but we'd have seen all of the problems with the models. Like this stands out like a sore thumb. The trunk just goes halfway up the tree and it's, it, it's not there. Um, so also the, the mountain range, you can barely see in these scenes. So this was the uh, first scene now this was the second scene from the Uzi animation. So if we load the remade one, close up firing. So I renamed them so they made more sense to me. So this is the VPR of that. And you can see it takes a lot longer to process up those frames because there's way more going on. So for this, the mountain range uh, I replaced, I had, uh, there is an image, which I can show you. So there's this image here, which is 6,854 pixels wide, and it's got uh, transparency on the top. And what I do is I project that onto a ring, and then I use this as an alpha image. So where it's white, it's transparent, where it's black, it's not. So all the mountains appear and all the bits above the mountains disappear. And so that becomes this image you can see in the background. And I don't know if I can get a different point of view. So there's the, there's the mountain. And the image itself has been painted so that it's seamless. So there's no, there's no sudden edge to it. I know this is very low renders. And you can see that if we, if we look up too high from this position, we see where the bottom of the mountain is and it's just, it's nothing. There's just a plot of land with uh, a mountain ring around it. If we zoom all the way out, you'll see that that's the actual plot of land. It's just a rectangular bit of land painted up and we put some detail around the edges and scattered a few trees. There's no trees over here, for example. There's, we never see this. Um, and that, what I said earlier about the um, the, that one object being used in a lot of scenes. This bit here is a little sort of ramp and it's the bit where the missile is chasing the worm in the other animation and he does the wall of death around it and then runs back down there. It's also, I believe, the location where the two worms are standing around and the guy throws the grenade over the, over the hill and they catch it and sort of bat it between each other. But that is the ring of mountains and outside of the ring of mountains is some sky. And it's just projected onto the inside of a ball. And basically you load that in, it's so big and so tall that you can load it in around any object and it doesn't matter where you look, you'll always see sky and mountains and, and all of that. So if we go back to the camera view, so here's our sky and here's our mountains. Here's a couple of trees and here's our land that we saw and our nice new Uzi object. Now, there's no way we could play this in real time because uh, it would completely choke the system. Yep, two pixels, two giant whopping pixels. That's all you're getting. Um, but what we can do is we could look at it in textured solid. Or in fact, let's have a, yeah, let's have a look at textured solid, not wireframe. So 
So this is it playing in real time. Now remember that, uh, that worm object. So you can see that the gun being moved over has fixed the arm. And I've, I've actually gone in and tweaked a few of the bones in, in a lot of these animations. But if we have a look at Worm Meta 2's details, he's currently uh, subdivided six times. So for every one of those original blocky shapes we had, there's six smoothed up round ones. But I can actually drop it down to zero and you can see the original shape that we were working with. So that's, that's the original geometry um, that I created based on the original Worm's geometry and then we've added a sixth uh, level uh, adjustment, uh, a, a, not adjustment, a sixth level uh, increase in detail to it and smoothness. Part of that was, yes, we fixed the armpits, but he got whoppingly buff. He got these massive biceps on him, uh, but actually I think it works. I think he, he uh, seems to sort of uh, do better with them um, and it helps bulk him out a little bit. Now, uh, another thing that I can show you is you can see this structure inside of his body, which these are the actual bones. This is the skeleton or if, this, if you were a um, model maker or a, a puppet maker, this is the armature that goes inside the skin. And if I just pick a point where we haven't got much going on and I pick that bone, this is the head bone. So I can just switch this into rotation mode and I can rotate his head up and down. Now you can see his eyes aren't attached to his head. And this is because several of these uh, structures, several of these controls actually control bones as well. So here is a, a, what we call a null object, which is basically just an axis in 3D space. It's got no shape or, or size or anything, but I'm gonna control its rotation now. And this bone, and these eyes and these eyebrows are all attached to it. Or at least the eyes are. So what is that bone attached to? Bone is attached to chest. Chest is attached to worms. Oh, okay, right, so. Now, I'd looked at this incorrectly. So this bone is animated separately and the eyes are animated to match the bone. And nowadays you could do that much, much more simply. Um, but what, basically what they've done is they've said that null object matches the rotation of this bone object so the eyes go where the bone goes. Um, what we could do, I mean this certainly won't, won't matter, is if we rotate his arm, you can see if you go too far it's still can tear and it can deform and it can look wrong. But we've got, we've got a little bit of control on that. And if we put the coordinate system into world, it makes it a little bit easier to animate. So we could have him hold the gun maybe from up the top there, which would be dangerous with all those bullet shells flying out, but you know. And, um, if we just set that in place, so now he's rather stupidly holding the gun from the wrong part. But it, like I say, we've got so much control on this that they built into the original models. You know, there's, there's not a lot going on there, but what there is, is plenty. Um, so here is the worm seen from a perspective view. So you can see there's all these bones down the tail. And if I wanted to, I could actually select a few, and then we can start turning them all at once. We can turn on the heading and the bank. Oh, you can snap. So yeah, there was a lot of control put into these because basically they built one object and just animated it however they needed. 
Now, you can't actually see the tail in that shot, so it, that's why it was straight down. They, they didn't animate things. Golden rule of 3D is never animate anything you don't see. Uh, and not unless it's going to cast a shadow onto somewhere that you can see. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a case of having to uh, pick apart the scenes, then pick apart the objects, then renovate the objects, then renovate the scenes, then fix any problems that were in the original animation, like hands going through guns and uh, trees through floors and things like that, and then re-rendering. And the rendering on this wasn't too bad. I mean, by going up to you know HD and what whatnot, it, it did increase the render as uh, the render times a lot. But if we just we can just do a test now. So this is going in and calculating all of the um, the meshes first, and then it renders it up. And that's just like the first pass, and then it goes in and it cleans up all the rough edges and anti-aliases the image and what have you. Um, so it's not too bad. We're, what, 10 seconds, 11 seconds now? Nearly done. There we go. So that was 26 seconds. It was still faster than the original um, Amiga version. But it's in HD. There's a lot more polygons. I mean, this um, is it scene editor. It might be properties or options. Um, somewhere there's a way of seeing how much, how many polygons are in the scene. I mean, the worm is 20,000 polygons. The tree obviously is... Uh... Oh, that's an instance of the tree. There's the tree. Um, 345,000 points, 123,000 polygons. Um, so there's vastly more information in these scenes than there was before. And I think it looks better. I think it's nice that we've got the originals, we've got the original files, and they've been re-rendered and saved. And I think it's nice that we've got some new scenes that uh, look modern and are rendered cleanly and, and produced digitally rather than the analogue system of the old days. Um, so let's have a look at a couple of those. So this is the airstrike. Uh, video, which uh, Perry Fractic does feature in his video, but he, he does zoom in on it a little bit. So uh, you don't see things like the new landscape that's in it. So if I just drag this down here. So in this one, we added the, uh, uh, some worms to the scene and the rockets were just floating underneath the helicopter. They weren't actually attached. So I've just pushed them into the rocket pods here so that they look like they're coming out of something. So here you can just see the land and it's only in shot for about five or five or ten frames. Uh, and there's loads of motion blur as well. But this was a um, satellite image of the coast of somewhere, somewhere in, uh, in the UK. And it was used as a flat, it's just a flat polygon with a picture painted on it, a bit like we did with the sky. Just to me mean that there's a little bit of detail as this goes past. Um, the smoke was replaced as well, that's an image uh, projected onto a sort of, if you can imagine a, a, a cross or a plus sign st uh, stretched uh, along, its, uh, along its Z axis. Um, and then you put the image on every single surface and it just sort of blends together and looks looks quite organic. It's much, much quicker than rendering out real smoke or, or volumetrics, which is the the 3D way that we do smoke and fire and gas and things like that. So, there we go. And that was that same image, uh, just with the camera further past the coast and just looking back. And so that was the, you saw the trees there. Um, that was the same tree as the pine tree, but with all the leaves stripped off it. So that's just the uh, the trunk and the twigs and the bark. Um, 
the flamethrower uh, animation. So again, lots of plant replacement. This was a nightmare because the plants themselves, the original ones, were very low detailed, but they were sized in a way that they, they met where the arms, so when he pushes the plant out of the way, it, he was touching it pretty much. And with these, that wasn't going to be the case because they're all different shapes and sizes, so there were some tweaks to animation and things like that. This is actually, this is the flamethrower from uh, one of the older Aliens games. Um, it might be Aliens vs Predator, it might have been Alien... Uh, <clears throat> oh, what's that new one? Where you Ripley's daughter or something like that. But yeah, it's, it was a, a model from, uh, from one of those that had been uh, released as, uh, as a free download. So uh, I thought we might as well make the use of it. And it's quite nicely detailed, but being a game model, you can actually see, again, on the, on the, uh, the outlet there, the, the edges of the polygon. So it wasn't perfect. And annoyingly, it was poked right into the camera. So if I was re-rendering these again, I'd go back and just, just put some more geometry in there. Now that effect there, if you remember on the original one, he had like a sort of a bluey gray gun and it drooped down, but because there wasn't a lot of detail in the way it drooped, because you can't just bend flat surfaces like I mentioned earlier. So for this gun, I actually put in about a thousand slices all along the length of the gun so that I could put bones in it and bend them down and there wouldn't be any uh, flat edges to worry about. So you can actually see that it sort of pinches up a little bit there because, and it did it in the original animation um, because where it's where it's bent over it's sort of tucking some of the geometry up inside um, but yeah it, it's what it still works it looks quite nice this I didn't change I actually was pleasantly surprised by how well this worked for what it is it's basically it's an orange cone um, that's twirled around pointing at the camera it's ridiculously simple but it works really really well so I, I like the look of it and I, so I kept it And the melting there, um, that was an object and another version of the object that had been stretched and deformed. And you just basically tell the software morph from one to the other. Now, because the original worm had been recreated, we've got the, the new Meta 2 worm, when you come to morph it, the morph doesn't match. It has to be the same number of points and in the same places, so it broke the animation. So I had to get the new Meta 2 worm and morph him into roughly the same shape as the old one. And then it started working. So that was that. Um, this is the teleport scene. Now, we were actually missing two shots in this uh, animation. There was, um, it's the bit where just after you see him sort of have an idea as if to say, ah, a cliff, I could go up there and in, in the original video, you then see him hold up like a blueprint paper, a piece of paper, like a Wile E. Coyote in an Acme cartoon. Uh, and he, you see him sort of plot, you know, go up there, drop bomb on baddies, win, get stuff. And there's two shots there, and I couldn't find scene files for them on the drives. So we had to lose them in the re-render and lose them in the modern version. Uh, this is the real reflections that I talked about. So this is the same binoculars model as was used in the original animations. But what I've done is I've applied that smoothing technique, that subdivision surfaces, and it's allowed it to be rounded off and it's, it's put more detail in instead of some sharp, sharp edges and curves. So yeah, this is a, this is a, a render that we did um, using real reflections so that it actually points back over the because there's a minefield basically behind the camera and so that's what it's seeing from that point of view which is this shot here i love the fact that you can you can barely see it and you really wouldn't have been able to read it in the original i don't think but one of these tents just says latrine on it all the others it did say danger minefield but the one this image on this sign was missing so we had to recreate that and um 
in, in looking at this, I noticed that it said latrine. So this is the idea, and then it would cut into the blueprint uh, sequence as the communicator. Now that was actually, that's a problem with uh, how Lightwave interprets transparent objects with fog. So if you, if you see here, this uh, section down here, all the fog has disappeared on this transparent object and I've no idea why. Um, it's just something that is happening at the moment with this version of Lightwave. So on the beam out you don't really see it, but on the beam in it's quite noticeable and I Looking at this, I wish I'd painted that out manually. I could have gone in and uh, photoshopped that to fix it. And again, this is that same um, uh, landscape object from all the other animations. We were just looking at it from a different point of view. Um, there's the missile, here we go. So this is a back projection image, we've actually done that in the remake. That was a sort of back projection. And all those jump all those jump cuts you just saw going around the wall of death, they were, um, I think it was four or five scenes, and there's only tiny little snippets of each scene. It's the same scene, he actually runs the whole way around the wall of death in every scene, but we only use very small sections of it, so it's just a case of rendering out those sections again. Classic cartoon trope, that is. We go um, and I think the last one we'll show you is the uh, kamikaze because this is in a different location so this uses um, a sort of almost a desert type scene with a with a river running through it and a bridge and one of the things that I'd noticed in the original is that when the camera looks up the river there's, it just ends it's a completely straight piece of river with no curves or bends and you just sort of see the edge of the world and it, it, it immediately draws your eye. So you'll see that uh, in the one scene, I think it's only one scene, uh, where you get to see up here, I've actually curved the river around now and it's, uh, it's a, bit more in, a bit more involved in the, in the landscape. With this, um, because I've increased the detail on the land, the land had picked up some curves and some shape changes. So of course, the first time I rendered this out thinking it was good, all the worms are floating across the land thinking that they're on the flat. And so I had to go in and hand position their height so that they stick back onto the ground across that sequence. It actually curves, that edge is curved over there. This, there's a whole tiny little sequence um, with the bandana and the drop the gun. And the bandana is uh, a straight object that is morphed into position. Nowadays, you would probably do that with bones and you'd actually animate the curvature using the bone structure. But this was actually just a morph that went from flat to curved. And of course, because we changed the head of the worm, that the bandana didn't fit, so we had to recreate the bandana. That meant changing the arms, and I mean, these arms aren't attached to the body. They aren't the arms of the worm. His arms are off the bottom of the screen, pointing outwards. They just have these stand-in arms that they put up, and it helps with the ease of the uh, animation. I did put a little tassel on the back of the 
on the back of the bandana which wasn't present on the originals and the guy with the green bandana has that as well. I love this. Who's this joke? There you go. That shot there. So that's where the river you just saw straight up to, the, to nothing and it just went to white. Uh, so I've put a little bit of curve in there. So who's this guy? Don't know. And again with that one, there was about six or seven scenes where it's there's, sometimes there's only 15 frames, which is less than a second. So there we go. So that about wraps up this very long winded and drawn out and possibly boring um, behind the scenes of the remake of the Worms cutscenes. That's a mouthful. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, hopefully it's been interesting to some of you. I know some people are, are into 3D, some people are light wave users, some people just like the old Worms stuff, some people like retro. I I love it all. So, um, you know, this was fantastic for me as a project to to actually attempt. And so, as I've said in the comments in Perry Fractic's video, and I've said to him uh, over email, big thanks for allowing me to get access to the files. And a big thanks to Chris as well, because uh, obviously this was his Amiga 4000. Without this, none of this would be possible. Um, I know Perry Fractic has released the uh, all the videos that I've created, so the original cuts, the re-rendered cuts, and the HD uh, versions, the modern versions. Um, so I don't need to do that. Um, but if you've seen them, if you've downloaded them and watched them, uh, mention it in the comments. I'd love to hear what you guys think of it, because as I say, for me, this was just such a fun passion project, being able to get access to stuff that was thought lost to the mists of time. You know, this is... This is like finding the Ark of the Covenant, being allowed to open it and asked, would you like to change the stuff that's in it? Um, or, you know, uh, please rewrite this piece of amazing work or re redo this fantastic movie. Um, this, is, this is part of my childhood or, or early adulthood, let's say. And so, yeah, it was a huge, huge thing for me to be able to get access to this and have a play with them. So hopefully I've done them justice. Hopefully, I mean, this was a very quick turnaround. Don't get me wrong. You know, I could spend months or years on this, but we turned this around in, we did the, the re-renders in a day, as I say, and then it was uh, a week later, um, I'd finished the last of the scenes uh, of the re-rendering. So... Uh, very, very quick turnarounds. I, I broke out all of my uh, my main computer here as a, as a Ryzen 8 core 16 thread. And that was on full overclock for two or three days straight. And I've got three little i7 computers that I fire up when I've got big render projects and I just get them involved and get them working. And everything, the, the whole room, well, the whole house when they're on was, uh, was uh, up in the high 20s, just uh, just, you know, keeping the place warm. And so uh, it was good to get them done in the time it, that I had. I would like to have spent more time on them, but I wanted to get something that uh, Perifractic could put into his video and, uh, and show the improvements and the changes. So yeah, as I say, thanks very much for watching. Hopefully you've made it to the end. I've no idea what we've run to. Let's have a look. Almost an hour. So this is almost an hour. So this is going to be a massive upload in a minute to YouTube. Um, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. Please let me know comments, uh, likes and dislikes and all that usual stuff. Um, have a look around on the channel. I'm, I'm not particularly active at the moment. It's YouTube isn't my main thing, but uh, I've done a lot of Elite Dangerous videos, a, a lot of CG, um, some projects, some electronic projects that I've done, like the, um, the Galaxy Star Map uh, to scale using LEDs and um, Perspex rods. And a few other bits and bobs besides. So have a look, have a rummage, see if there's something you like, let me know. Um, and if you want to see anything more involved on this, if you'd like me to go into more detail of remaking these objects or anything like that, by all means let me know and we'll see what we can do. So for now, thanks for watching and I will see you again soon.